Good afternoon. This is Canada Tortoise Capital with a review of the weekend trading reports for July 13th, 2019. Shout out to the team here for the uh, research weekend and live trading week. Appreciate their patience for suffering through this. Education is pain. Uh, and so we must be well educated because it hurts. So the market is in bullish normal conditions on a short term basis uh, using the NDX 10. We are at the high end of overbought at 99 out of 100. And on an annual basis, we are at 100, which means that we are um, at the peak of the annual um, price level. So deeply uh, overbought in both conditions. Um, in the market mosaic, price with respect to the 200-day moving average is green bullish at 8.23%. That means we're over 5% above the 200-day moving average and the uh, and the boundary of to sideways. Oh, we're 8% over it, so we're we're 6% above the boundary to sideways. So this is uh, this is very good. Slope of the 50 has Im, um, improved to 0.22%. So that is yellow bearish. Um, that's slowly getting better. ADX 14 is strongly trending at 27.8 to the bullish side. The risk index is the 30 period moving average of the VIX divided by the 10. 1.0 is the boundary between risk on and risk off. The current reading at 1.135 is deeply into risk on. We take that score and compare it to the last 5,000 trading days and compute the risk C by finding the average and one standard deviation above or below gives, would give us a Z score of one or minus one. That current reading at 1.39 means that we're almost 1.4 standard deviations above the historical norm, so this is extremely uh, bullish. It's so bullish that it may not last much longer. That's what that is. So the risk Z uh, histogram shows a time series of the last 90 days, and you can see that we've moved from, uh, in the last 45 days or so, from a risk Z score of minus two standard deviations to positive 1.5. The improvement in the volatility statistic there has been almost three and a half Z scores. That has been a uh, brilliant time to be long, and we're going to see that uh, reflected in the slope of the 30 period regression line, which is as steep as it has been in the last 10 years, uh, an incredibly powerful move over the last 30 days. When you see extreme readings like that in the broad markets, you have to wonder, is that was that just leg one and we got another one of those coming? Or has everybody that was going to bought, bought? Everyone was going to buy, have they bought? Um, so we got to be careful about being near the end of a bull run and so we're going to be paying special attention to those positions where we've gained uh, uh, profits that we want to maintain and so we're going to be judicious about adding secondary positions. In the next video when we take a look at the portfolio management we'll see a number of positions that I exited on Friday because the results were so extremely good that I just couldn't take it anymore and I wanted to reduce my exposure um, to potential gain uh, to potential reversals next week if the market keeps going up i can get back into those on an intraday basis but i wanted to lock in a bunch of swing trades so you will see at the end of a really good run like this when we are well beyond a 1.0 on the risk c uh, that's where it gets more and more likely for turning points we haven't seen it yet but i wanted to lock in gains while the market's at all-time highs uh, so that's the story behind risk C. Uh, in blended monthly rebalancing, you can see that the next reevaluation will be on or about 1 August. The current holdings for that should read July uh, are uh, the Qs, Australia, and uh, the S&P. And then the holdings for ETF 22 and 32 um, feature uh, technology, consumer staples, and financials, and then an ETF 32, Brazil, which has been making a very nice move uh, as well. Um, the current leaders as of uh, Friday, you can see for each of those various portfolio uh, families, uh, the current holdings um, or the current ratings as of Friday. Um, and that includes the, uh, you know, the Dow 30, the sectors, and the ETF 200 portfolio. 
Um, in ETF2, the theoretical uh, exposure of that asset allocation model is at 100%. That means that all 10 of the regional indexes in that model are above their four-month moving average. And so this is a time to be uh, long and strong and fully committed on the long side. This is a look at the ETF 13 um, uh, portfolio. And you can see they're all on buy signals. The uh, two strongest sectors on the blended performance there are the Qs and the S&P. And technology has been very good with a one-week percentage score of two in the green. That means it's exceptionally good, and it's going to be great over one month. So technology is dominating. It's also interesting to note that DIA is doing uh, almost as good. And that would tell you that the technology members of the Dow 30 right now, unless things change, uh, I'm looking for those to be momentum continuation plays. So if the market is up uh, on Monday and those are doing better than the market, then I'm going to be piling on names like Intel, IBM, Microsoft, Cisco, Apple as a, as a default position. Now, uh, the treasuries have been suffering and were uh, horrible last week. And at the very bottom of the stack, you see Japan and emerging markets have been lagging. Uh, so right now, it looks like uh, all U.S. and especially tech. Uh, ETF uh, 32 uh, takes that same basic 13 and adds some additional more specific subsectors. So we add the XL sector spiders and then a few of the country and regional indexes. And again, you see everything except Europe and China are on buy positions. So China and Europe have been lagging. They are below their four-month moving average. That's why they're on cash positions. And you can see that China has been horrible and the last week was still bad. So conversely, if the market is up or down, but China is doing worse, and especially if they're losing, then uh, China would be the first place I look to get short. If the market is down, and when I say the market, I mean the S&P, if the S&P is down but China is worse, then China is going to be my go-to position for shorting. The same thing uh, with Europe. But everything else has been long and strong. Now, I notice that the uh, commodity index, DBC, has been bad, but the last one week and one month have been good. So that may signal something like a um, a uh, buying quality on sale. It's been horrible and now starting to get better. So that's in the springtime. Now, if that's really true, then those things could go on and eventually work their way to the top of the stack, and we were getting, them, getting in on them earlier. So uh, that's why those are of interest to me. The energy sector as a sector looks like that as well. It's had a great month and a great week, but long term it's been horrible. So this might be a, uh, a chance to look at that sector, which is different than the market performance itself, but starting to turn. So I'd be looking at, at oil and then the uh, as well as the sector, but I'm looking at things like Chevron, uh, ExxonMobil, and then Devon Energy, that mid cap company that we like so much. Other things that are of interest here, uh, industrials, XLI, and DIA are green and white on the one week and one month. So that may be early in their outperformance, and they're just beginning to emerge as short-term leaders, so there may be more room for them to continue. So I will take a look at those charts and frame them with care when I get to the uh, chart review. So that's on my short list of things to prepare. Uh, in the Dow 30, the, uh, the winners... Uh, Long-term, Disney, Microsoft, uh, American Expre Express, and Visa um, have been above average but not exceptional over the one week and one month. But what looks really amazing is Goldman Sachs, which is on the white for blended percentage but has had outstanding performance one week and one month. So uh, I'll be interested in um, continued performance uh, or momentum plays in that. Also, at United Health demands a close look. A 7% one week return makes that exceptional on its own merits. So I would compare that to the healthcare sector and in the market. So if the market were up and healthcare were better than the market, but United Health is even better than the sector, then that's going to be 
uh, one of my top three or four things to focus on immediately. So the logic chain gets me from the market to the sector to the target, and I'm building on the idea of a continuation of momentum. Uh, Boeing has continued to do well. It's recovered well from uh, the bad news of the um, 737s. Uh, and so that's one of the contributors to strengthen the Dow. So if the Dow is better than the market and Boeing's better than the Dow, then that'll be a place where I can continue to buy uh, recovering momentum. Intel especially love this one. Remember my previous remarks about technology. Well, it's been horrible on the blended return, but last week it was exceptional so it's green and it's above average on the one month so i believe there's still more room for intel to go to catch up to the outperforming tech sector so this is almost like kim anderson's legendary uh pair trading where now the thing that had been lagging is now starting to catch back up to the sector there may be some more buying opportunities as people continue to be convinced that intel may not be going to zero so that's how we read the the different color codes to help us uh, get broad insights into uh, shorter term and longer term momentum. By the same token, Caterpillar is white for the one week and green on the one month. And that may mean that its one month outperformance is starting to slow down. So white then green is a signal to be cautious and make sure that we've locked in gains on Caterpillar. And the same would then be true of Home Depot, which is white and green. Um, in the sector spiders, um, semiconductors linking in with technology, that's been green all the way across the board and continued its strong performance, so I like that. And down there in telecom, XTL, uh, that's a short-term bump, so both of those would be con candidates for short-term momentum. Um, the biggest losers were treasuries and healthcare. Um, so that's very interesting that United Health. Um, outperformed everything else, but healthcare as a sector was horrible. So it may be the case that United Health is the leader in the healthcare sector. So imagine this scenario the market's good and healthcare is better. United Health is going to be fabulous because that's re the market and the sector would reward it. But if the market were good and the healthcare sector were good, but United Health is bad, it may be done. And so leadership may be rotating to the next leaders in the clubhouse. So uh, that will be an investigation for us in the, in the week ahead. So that's the sector spiders. In ETF Max, we're now looking at those 260 very liquid ETFs. And then these are the top performers on the blended percentage um, for those liquid, liquid ones. Um, gold miners, uh, comes to mind here. They've had a great performance and a great one month, and we're going to see the gold miners are great in the ETF2 as well. Um, but this will give you some idea of the top end momentum winners for the long term, and it would allow us to trade to trade frame off of that. Um, in the ETF2 regional report, we're now using a slightly different lens to look at strength, consistency, and quality uh, to look for uh, long-term relative strength. So um, uh, nine out of the ten uh, sectors are on a buy signal. One is on cash. So that should actually read 90% and 10% because the underperformance of uh, Europe gives us a little bit less confidence on, on why we want to be fully committed. So that weakness in, um, in Europe is now of a concern. So that should read 90 and 10. Um, the market's in bullish normal conditions. On a global basis, the S&P with a strength rating of 66 is stronger than EFA at 51. So right now, the S&P, which represents about 52% of the market global market cap, is outperforming the rest of the developed world, which is represented by EFA, which is that blend of the Euro-Asia. So right now, the default position is to look for momentum to continue in the U.S. rather than the globals. Inside the U.S., the strength is in, now I'm looking at the strength column, technology at 71, then the S&P large caps at 66, then the mid caps at 55, which were in the white, and now the U.S. small caps are uh, the laggards in the U.S. and they're in the yellow, so they're actually below the average of that 260 ETF. So right now, 
the winning positions are large caps and technology and the Russell 2000 are the laggards. So if the market were bad and the Russell were worse than the IWM or the Russell 2000 futures contract becomes a candidate for intraday shorting as weakness continues to fail faster. So that's how we the logic chain gets us from market conditions to the sector or to the asset class. The two weakest sectors are emerging markets in Latin America. Uh, inside the sector spiders, looking at the strength column, technology, staples, and discretionary are green and great. And the energy sector, which had been red, is now in the yellow. So energy is starting to make that turn, although it's still lagging behind its contemporaries inside the U.S. So I'll be looking for that as a point of differentiation. And I then take those strength ratings and put this on a geographic map. I start with the U.S. in the middle. And uh, most of the U.S. is above average, and the technology, upper hand right, is exceptionally good. Um, uh, uh, Europe is below average. Uh, Asia, less Japan, is above average, but Japan is lagging. You can see China and South Korea are, Korea are exceptionally bad but strength is in Australia, Taiwan, and Philippines. Inside the Western Hemisphere, Brazil has been brilliant. Canada has been above average, but Mexico is horrible. Now, that's really good news for short-term traders because Mexico and Brazil ETFs are outstanding intraday trenders, so they're great for frog trading, but they also have powerful swing moves because they react on a, uh, on a different basis than the, the global giants of uh, Europe, the U.S., and Asia. So while those things are cycling on the global superpower level, um, Mexico and Brazil can be very trending in their own uh, in their own way. So they are least correlated among the big assets asset classes to the broad market. So the fact that one is red and one is green gives us a real possible pair trade to set up in the way that Kim Anderson uh, so beautifully described to us. Um, uh, inside Europe, the strength is in Switzerland and France. Austria is lagging. Uh, in the other asset classes, gold has been exceptional. Treasuries, bonds, real estate, and private equity are above average, and commodities, oil, and silver have been uh, underperforming. So there's a possible pair trade there in the precious metals between silver and gold that might be of interest. Now, if I take the top uh, ETF 30s based on liquidity and then so this is an extract of that ETF2 report you can see the silver miners are greens across the board Brazil is of exceptional interest because it's green and white that means it has been above average but is now brilliant so EWZ is something that I really like um, uh, gold at green and white is is there and uh, Vanguard dividend appreciation ETF is green and white. So the people that are buying that are buying into large cap stocks that are outperforming, but which also pay a nice dividend. So a long-term position holder that wants to get paid from dividends might be interested in that ETF, but this might be the time to be overweight that because you're getting both capital appreciation and dividend payouts for long term. But otherwise, you see those that are green and green in strength and uh, consistency, the winners are continuing to win. The two uh, that are of interest that are starting to lag are semiconductors, SOXX, and treasuries. Those were green on consistency but white on strength. And that means what has been great might be coming only above average. So it's maybe losing momentum. So in the same way that Brazil is green and white, that's a new emergent leader. These are leaders that are starting to lag. So I'm going to make sure that if I'm in those positions that my stops are in place and I'm protecting the profits that I may have in those. The ETF liquidity report shows the top 30 ETFs based on average daily dollar volume. Uh, and then you can see how dominant the S&P, the Qs, and the IWM are. So these are all symbols that have enough liquidity that can be traded successfully intraday because there's enough liquidity that leads to narrow um, spreads. So that's the weekend report for a strategy basis. I'm now going to shift to the Tortoise Daily Report, which is based on Friday price action. 
And this is the usual daily report from Friday for Monday. Those first 10 pages are the primary places that I look for uh, particular signals. Uh, pages 11 through 18 are deeper dives uh, that are technical in nature um, that are not necessary for understanding um, what are good candidates, but allows you to go deeper into the research if you're interested. So here we go. Starting with the market health check, I'm looking at three look back periods, one day, 10 days, and 30 days. And I color code those yellow, then orange, then yellow to get an appreciation for the highs and lows of those look back periods. And I use those look back periods to help me auto frame um, based on standard uh, resistance and support levels. So you can see the one day uh, is at the top of the 10 day and the 30 day. That's, so that's how overbought this market has been. Um, the 10-day the trading range you see marked off in orange, again, we're at the top of that, and that's the top of the 30-day period. So look how beautiful that move has been over the last 30 days. Now, um, it had been at a previous swing high um, at the, uh, the very extreme left-hand chart uh, of the chart. And then the dragon rolled over, and you see that it sold off from about 295 all the way down to 275. That's 20 bucks on thir on 300. That's about an 8% sell-off from that swing high to the belly of the dragon where it bottomed out there around 275. The blue 10-period regression line crossed, <coughs> crossed the uh, dragon after three days of improvement. You'll notice the PSAR flip, which and then on the MACD histogram below, you see us going from a winter into the spring at that green dot. That's right where the RLXD crossed the dragon. That's the third criteria of the owl pattern, but we know from research that you can start thinking about incrementing in at, the, at that point. So when it went into the spring, we should be thinking about getting long in that position. And then you'll notice that that move uh, takes you from about 280 up to 300. That's, a tw that's uh, 20 bucks on 280. That's a 7% potential gain. Um, and halfway up, you see where it came and tested the bottom of the dragon. That might have gotten you out. But if it did, when it then uh, crossed back above the dragon, that should get you back in. So you could take that in two stages. Or your, your PSAR stop never got you out of this whole position the whole way up. So this is a, a, a discussion of the market health but it also provides information that might be tradable in the standard way using the RLCO framework and some of our second generation patterns. Other things that I'm looking for. So I look at the MACD histogram. We are back into the summer. So we went from winter to the spring to the summer. When it went into the fall after that pullback, we were cautious and concerned. But it didn't fail, and it found support, so we just recently went back into the summer. And so that makes me cautiously optimistic that we may see more gains to the upside because there's no resistance overhead, and the rest of the world has been lagging, so it's all U.S. all the time. So if I saw strength in energy, which has been lagging but is starting to gain, and strength in technology, both of those would continue to drive this market higher. Um, and there's a justification for going uh, uh, up that wall of worry. Um, that's how I'm interpreting that. The, the thick purple line is the RL270. That's the long-term fair value. You notice that is also moving up and accelerating. So the long-term market condition is feeling pretty good. The green line is the 90-period regression line. That has turned up and is continuing to go. And you notice that both the... Uh, 30 and the 10 are outside of the river, so this is continuing the trending behavior. I want you to notice the move of the last 30 days in that big yellow box. The steepness of that 30-period regression line that, that um, uh, integrates that, that price, that's as good a 30-day performance in terms of slope of that performance as we've seen in the last 10 years. That's how good that move has been, and that's why I was cautious about taking some of the money out of that market because that was such an abnormally good move. I was concerned about bad news over the weekend and a gap down on Monday. So I sold about half my position and locked in those gains. But if I see return to 
to gains, I'm ready to put that back into the market. So this was me hedging against my own positions to cash them when I can rather than I have to. So that's some trade portfolio management longer term. Uh, now, the, um, the busy charts. You've already seen the market health check and the market classification to the upside. Um, I next look at the channeling and overreaction. No signals there. Those that are doing intraday trading with futures can use the daily pivot points to find support and resistance based on how the futures guys look at those. Um, the 10-day min pain and max pain are candidates that uh, price with respect to their own 10-day high. The min pain, those are the five members of each of those portfolio families that have lost the least from their 10-day high. So that's sort of like relative strength leaders. I'm more interested in the 10-day max pains. These are the ones that have suffered the most from their 10-day high. They could be candidates to get short if the market starts failing or if they start recovering, this is a, a chance to buy quality on sale. So I like framing that because the pain is already built in and I feel like I have some cushion of a, a return to the 10-day high. So for me, I'll be looking at Merck, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer. Oh, that's consumer staples in healthcare right there. Verizon and then Walgreens. So four out of the five are consumer staples that are also related to healthcare. Um, I'm very interested in that as a category. The Dow 30 tactical summary on the left hand side you see mechanical uh, systems and if there's a green square filled in those have fired on a mechanical basis so right now Merck fired on both channeling and overreaction and I know those are uh, long term reliable mechanical signals so I could either just put a market buy at the open or I could frame that trade and if I see actual performance then I can get long and I'm using intraday techniques to refine uh, my my entries. Uh, the top five max pain range compressions, those are the ones that have a combination of lost the most from their 10 day high and had a small range on Friday. That means we may start seeing a return uh, to the upside based on that lack of volatility. So Merck, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson. Now what I really like about 3M is here is a symbol that's in the green that means he had a one day performance that was exceptional compared to the rest of the Dow 30. It was already up 2.54 percent on Friday but it's also a max pain range compression so this is something that had sold off sharply from its 10 day had a relatively small range but has already turned in one day a good performance so if it's starting to work that's a second day momentum on its way back up to the 10 day high so I love me some 3M right now um, that's how we read that the next thing I look at is RSI 2 you see that Merck and, and Johnson and & Johnson are both in the green because their numbers are 4 and 2. So an RSI 2 gets below 10 when there's been like two days of washout selling the closed weekly. That is quite often an indication of a handoff to the guys that now want to buy quality on sale. So I like looking at those for potential recovery from a two-day harsh sell-off. You see those symbols in the price change that are in red. So Merck, Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson are all in the red. So Merck uh, lost 1.6 on Friday. It's down 5% over the last 10 days and down 4.8% over the last month. Those are coded red because relative to the rest of the Dow, those are so bad that they stand out by being exceptionally bad. Well, that's true for Merck, Pfizer, and Johnson and Johnson. Conversely, uh, 3M and, uh, and Caterpillar were exceptional one-day performers. Caterpillar is also up 8.86% over the last one month. That's so good it turns out that it gets a green rating on the price change percentage and so on. Moving over to the NDX column, uh, what I want you to notice is that um, Johnson & Johnson has a score of minus 105 over the last 10 days. That's so bad. That means if you took the 10-day trading range of Johnson & Johnson 
and made that on a score of 0 to 100, it lost that much on one day, so that had to be a big gap down. And, and uh, now from extreme conditions come extreme results. So that's going to tell me, go trade frame Johnson & Johnson. Now, the reasons that it sold off might be correct, and then there's more pain following. So if it breaks through Friday's low, I'm auto-shorting that one with everything I got because there's more pain following. But it may also be the case that that was an overreaction to bad news and somebody wants to buy Johnson & Johnson long term. Well, how can you not want to own Johnson & Johnson for the long term if you're a uh, mutual fund manager or pension fund manager buying one of the great companies on a 10% sell? Oh, it's on sale. So there's going to be people at some point interested in Johnson & Johnson. So all I know is that the price is not going to stay where it is. So I, that's in a critical state. And now I'm going to be prepared to trade frame that in either direction. It's also outside of its one month trading range with a score of minus 65. So that's so bad that I already know that that's going to be beautiful. I use this in order to look at charts that give me an edge when I get there. Because if I look at a chart long enough, I'll find a reason to trade it. But I want to start with those charts that have a lot of good reasons to, tr to frame them. So I'm going to be looking at Johnson & Johnson and Merck for sure. But look further down the chart. You see all those things that are in the green? Same thing only to the upside. So let me find the thing that has the biggest score. Uh, I'm looking at Home Depot. Had a score of 151 on the 10-day. And it broke out of its one-month, three-month, and six-month trading range. Anytime it gets above 100, that gets color-coded green because like a raccoon, I'm attracted to shiny things. The fact that Home Depot made a 10-day, one-month, three-month, and six-month high means that there's no resistance overhead. And any continued buying pressure uh, will continue that momentum. So I'm going to be especially interested in Home Depot to the upside, and probably also um, DIA. Oh, when the index itself broke out so significantly to the 10-day high, that means big money is moving that thing in every time frame, and there's more buying pressure uh, going in there. So I'm ready to reward any momentum in DIA to the upside. If it doesn't follow through, now I'm concerned about the short side uh, and getting trapped. So that was the reason I took some money off the table so that if it starts to fail, I can quickly hedge with the capital that I raised on Friday. But if it starts working, eh, I'll get back in. I've been wrong before. I don't have to be right. I just can't be wrong too long. I might write that down. So just from this one-day summary of signals, I can get some insights to short-term and long-term performances using strategies that I just described using the price change percentage and the NDX and the RSI2. I have some information from the frog box and the gap stats and the fail stats so I can immediately start trade framing my intraday stuff but I also am getting some insights from the mechanical systems and then the max pain range compression and the auto framer. So I have plenty of information available to me to start looking for uh, trade frame candidates to prepare. My plan just has to give me a dozen good ideas. My preparation allows me to go to the next level of detail. So that's the Dow tactical. The explanation is down at the bottom of how I'm reading those charts. ETF 30 to the is the same thing, but now the ETF 30 usual suspects. Um, lots of frog quality numbers greater than three. So they're all highlighted in green. What that means is that the market itself has had a combination of positive gains and lessing, lesser volatility. That's how you get a great frog quality number. So that's a market condition that tells me intraday trading with the frog rule sets in their various forms um, are a good way to go. If the market's going up, that frog will get us long. If the market starts going down, that frog is going to get us short. And so now I want to be especially prepared for that short-term trading. Monday is going to be a very interesting day. 
Um, you can see the leaders and the laggards based on the color code of the symbols. That's geared to the one-day performances. Look at all those things on the NDX that broke out of their 10-day, one-month, three-month, and six-month um, uh, trading ranges. Um, the Dow w had the biggest relative move, and then the S&P consumer discretionary had the next bigger move. So we can think about Matt Richardson's beautiful uh, discussion of pair trading and um, and regime for risk on and risk off. So now if the large cap stocks are doing exceptionally well as an asset class and the consumer discretionary stocks are doing well as an asset class, that tells me there's some long-term money buying the U.S. and buying some of those discretionary stocks and I would not be surprised with more follow-through despite all of the reasons that you could imagine uh, not to believe in that, some of which caused me to harvest some money as a hedge over the weekend. So there's a lot of good things to be interested in there as well. Metals and mining is of interest, XME, because that's been bad for 10 days, 3 months, and 12 months, and yet it was pretty good. So now things like copper and Alcoa and Home Depot and um, Freeport Moran, some of those commodity base. Oh, Australia is of interest to me because that was long-term good, and it has an economy that is geared towards basic materials. So I can actually play the whole commodity sector by either using DBC, which is the blended commodities, which had reasons to be interested, but I, I can also play EFA, the Australian uh, market, and get some of that Australian goodness. Um, and I may take a look at the uh, currency pair between the Aussie dollar and the yen or Aussie dollar US to see if there is a currency component to the outperformance. Uh, and so for you currency traders out there, there's some good ideas, potential. Hey, look at us. We're three pages into this report and we got many things more to look at. The daily pinch and stretch. Um, column one, this is the percentage each of these symbols closed above its Bollinger Band mean. We take that percentage stretch and compare it to its, its historical norm and express that as a z-score. So United Health is not only 7% above its Bollinger Band mean, the middle of the river, that also equates to one and three quarters standard deviations of stretch historically. So that's really an exceptional move and it's almost too good to believe in. So that may be a case where mm, the easier, there's no such thing as easy money, but maybe the easier money has already been made. So I'm going to be careful to lock in any gains that I have there because its stretch has been so good. Doesn't mean it can't keep going, but it means, it means to be mindful of the gains that you have when you see it in green. So everything that's in the green on that stack, all of those have had exceptional stretches compared to their historical norms. You see in the grayed out area, SPY, IWM, and DIA. Those indexes are so important to me in terms of understanding the market conditions that I always want to know where those things are. So the things that make it to the top 10, uh, that's coming out of the top 60 ETF 30 and the Dow 30. So those are the most exceptional ones. But I always want to know what the broad U.S. markets are doing so I can see, is there a distinction between the S&P and the big fat large caps and DIA or the S&P versus the small cap speculative traders? So I always like to know where the, where the risky versus the conservative versus the mainstream are in terms of relative strength and relative location. That's a way to appreciate the U.S. market. That's especially good right now because the U.S. market has been leading the way compared to the rest of the world. So that's where the action is. So that one column gives me a bunch of ideas as a strategy. You might decide you like that and do research and turn that into a mechanical system. But that's the difference between a strategy, which is a broad principle-based approach to gaining advantage, versus a system which is a purely mechanical, codable, robotically tradable set of rules that have rigor. So one strategy can support multiple systems, but a system can be traded by code. So that's column one. 
column two or the section two is the most negative Z stretch. Same thing, but on the other end. Remember we talked before about Merck and Johnson and Johnson. Merck is four and a half percent below its Bollinger Band mean, and that is a 2.2 percent or 2.2 sigma adverse stretch. So it's beyond the Z2. In fact, if that's so important that if it comes back above Z2, that means it had an excursion and it's now coming back into normal. And now the move just back to the Bollinger Band mean may be a tradable moment on a quality company in a sector that has been lagging, but it may be recovering. Johnson & Johnson, the anomaly, is one and a quarter standard deviations out of the river. So that's of interest and so on. Column three or section three, the most expanded pinch box. This is looking at the width of the river itself. So it takes 30 days of directional movement in one direction to make that river get expanded. This is like the width of the Bollinger Band. So gold is almost three standard deviations wide. That tells you how powerful that move has been. That's unusual behavior in gold. And so, especially in gold, I'm not trading that one long term because I think, again, the easier money is already made. I'm much more interested in protecting those gains. But if the market were to tank, that means gold could keep going. And people are buying gold as a hedge against the sell-off in the, in the equities. So if the market is weak and gold is doing better, uh, alert, go take a look at the gold miners, which we're going to see is the best performing ETF out of all 260 on the ETF too. So... When gold is good, gold miners can be great. So that, that relationship now can help steer you using the logic chain to find things that are valuable. Microsoft has, is the only other thing that has a wide uh, river, that pinch box, if you will. That's the width of the river. So that tells me that Microsoft has been on an uh, outperformance and tech has been good and Microsoft has been great. Microsoft could be that leader that was helping tech at the same time that Intel was a tech laggard that is starting to work. So now there's a relationship now between great tech, Microsoft, and lagging tech, Intel, but which has some room to make up. So you pick which end of that curve you're interested in. I'm ready to trade either one of those. Coca-Cola, on the other hand, with a score of minus 1.05. That means the river has compressed to an abnormally tight range. And I'm going to go frame Coca-Cola as a potential Z3 breakout. That's how tightly compressed the Coca-Cola uh, trading range has been. Its volatility is compressed to such a level that it's exceptional. And then when I look at the right-hand side, um, I look at all of those uh, exceptionally compressed pinch boxes. Verizon, Europe, oh, Mexico, and trout. Mexico, oh, 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 that's beautiful for intraday frog trading. And it also trades beautifully as a swing because it moves to its own drummer. It is not so caught up in the, um, the global superpower economic stories. So it's both a good intraday and a swing trading candidate. That's why it's a, it's a frog champion. It's a brilliant intraday trader, but it also is a good swing trader. And the fact that its uh, river has compressed so much, it now allows for a breakout swing trade in either direction. If that were to happen, you would also see expanded intraday trading ranges. So Mexico is at the start of what I hope will be a long and colorful career over the next two weeks of both intraday and directional trading. So note to self, when I prepare that one tonight and tomorrow, I'm going to be especially ready for Brazil, Mexico, Merck, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, Gold, the miners, DIA, Microsoft, Intel. Oh, I'm exhausted from thinking of all the work that I'm about to do. Thank goodness that the reports will help us do that. The auto framer automatically sets up the mechanical entry and the exit. If it takes out yesterday's high or low, it tells us what those price levels are, what the 1R trailing stop would be, and then what the reward to risk ratio would be if it gets back to the 10-day high. So, treasuries, it's 
of the daily ranges from Friday to get back to the 10-day high. So if it opened inside yesterday's range, takes out the high, I presume that's because the market will start to panic. If the market has a one-day panic and follows through, there could be a two- or three-day swing trade to the downside. And now treasuries, which have sold off, there could be a flight to quality. And if that happens, it's four and a half mechanical ranges back to the 10-day high. Treasuries are going to be a good flight to quality trade frame as a contingency. So if that scenario comes to pass, I could get a nice little weekly swing trade on treasuries um, based on that criteria and so on. Europe, Merck, EFA, emerging markets, Verizon, and oil explora exploration all test out better than two to one on the reward to risk ratios. <clears throat> we'll talk about that in greater detail when we look at trade framing tomorrow. <clears throat> but the um, risk calculations give us a number of choices about how to establish that initial risk that gets us to those favorable reward to risk ratios just on a swing trade alone. This helps us swing trade one day at a time. The second half, the regression line fractal framework, takes a look at the difference between the long-term fair value expressed as the RL270 and compares that to the trader's price, the RL10. The difference between those two creates the difference between what the long-term guys think is fair value and what the current guys are trading it at. The greater that difference, the greater the difference of opinion between long-term and short-term traders. That difference of opinion creates a tension that must be resolved. One of those groups is right. If the traders are right, then that price is going to continue to be uh, far away from the RL270, and then the RL270 will slowly move to catch up. But if the long-term buy and holders are right, then this excursion by the traders will run out of gas, and then it will be a reversion to the mean trade back to the long-term fair value. How much is that difference of opinion? It depends on what the, we're going to express that as a multiple of the average true range of that instrument, which we can use as a standard unit of risk for framing swing trades. So the way we read that, in the top shelf, those in the green, those are the symbols that are the most number of average true ranges below their long-term fair value. So they're green. That's good to go. That means that 3M, which I already love for, C, for the reasons that I said previously, see previous discussion, that has an ATR of $2.79. So approximately $3 is one ATR. Its reward to risk ratio just to get back to the RL270 is almost 5 to 1. And that's with the $3 stop. That tells you a reasonable upside move over the next two weeks could be $15 in 3M. Knowing that, I can see if there's a swing trade frame. If I'm a day trader, I could set up that swing trade. Then if I see 3M intraday outperforming the S&P on a day the S&P is up, I can get some intraday goodness. And then as it goes towards the close, sell 80% of my position. And now I've earned money intraday to carry the overnight risk on the swing trade. And now I've used market's money to take the risk and I get my seed money out of there. That's swing trading one day at a time using core and turbo techniques. So by looking at this, I can, in the Dow 30, the ones that appeal to me are um, Merck and 3M. Uh, Boeing is kind of interesting, it's still, it's, but it's only got a two to one ratio for reward to risk, but certainly 3M and Merck. Among the ETF 100s, um, natural gas and China are around two and a half or one and a half ATR. So there's not as many good candidates that are underneath their long-term fair value. But that's that's how I can use that if I'm interested in buying quality on sale, and I use the RL270 as the reversion to the to the mean trade. The bottom shelf. These are the symbols that are the most numbers of ATRs above their long-term fair value. Now, I'm not surprised to see the, these large multiples. Home Depot is almost 8 ATR above its long-term fair value. So you see, as a general rule here, all of these candidates are many multiples 
beyond their RL270. That's not unusual when you consider how powerful the last 30 days have been for those large cap stocks. So all of them have been on a buying frenzy. So the leaders are going to be the most advanced beyond their long-term fair value. So those are candidates for continuing to re reward momentum. If they keep going, those are your leaders. Home Depot, um, uh, Visa, General Electric, Walmart, Walmart, uh, Walmart, believe it or not, and then AXP. Uh, and then in the and then the other symbols, consumer. I think that's Staples is XLY. I may be wrong. Um, Moo is uh, uh, cattle futures. There you are commodity people so right now everything in that stack of five is at least six ATRs beyond their fair value if I wanted to play on the short side I might just pick if I used two ATRs as my trailing stop and it sold off two there's still four to get back to its long-term fair value so I can now use this as a way to rapidly frame swing trades simply on the basis of trade location price price with respect to a standardized way of looking at long-term fair value. Um, tomorrow I'll cover more about the logic behind the regression line fractal framework, but this is simply a way to look at the difference between the trader's current price expressed by the RL10 and the long-term buy and, buy and hold fair value, the difference between the RL10 and the RL270. So I'm using those, the outside pair, the 10 and the 270, the fast of the fast pair and the slow of the slow pair to get the biggest measurement of the difference of opinion between traders and holders. When those two things come together, for that moment, the traders and the holders both agree that that's the fair price. If the volatility is low, then that sets up that super pinch. Because now, the next, all I know is that that price is not going to stay that way forever. The traders are going to start their excursion. So when we talk about regression line fractal framework, that's a rapid way to find out um, what is ready, what is pinched and ready to explode. So that's how we might read that chart. The auto framer gives you some of those mechanical entries. The other ones you can frame by inspection when you look at the, uh, the daily charts. The daily squeezes. So this is a way to do swing trading one day at a time. So what we do is we take a look at their... Uh, uh, average true range over the last 14 days, that's sort of the expected size of the daily move. And then we compare Friday's range, the last day's range. If that is small, then that means that there was a range compression, not much activity. So if it opens inside that range and then breaks out above or below, and we just take a one-day average move, that ratio is now expressed in the reward to risk. We take that range stat, which is the maximum intraday move, which is an average plus a standard deviation, divide it by the range risk. So that means uh, C, which is uh, Citibank. Oh, Microsoft, beauty. It compressed to such a level that it's like a coiled spring and is ready to break out. I'll talk more about that when we get into preparation. But this is a way to use swing trade characteristics to find one-day pops. So if these things, these things are all poised that if they just make a normal move, then you can get a one-day gain on this, and you can just pick that daily and use that as a, if there's nothing else going on. There's plenty of things going on already, but sometimes the other trends aren't so clear. And uh, uh, Friday was such a low volatility day that a breakout in either direction is warranted. And I look on there and I see things like... Um, SPY, oh, the market itself is poised for a sharp pop in either direction. That's, uh, that's interesting because they were willing to hold a highly advanced market overnight. There wasn't anybody even trying to play shenanigans. That market is ready to pop in either direction. I can't wait for Monday. This next one, the four seasons of the MACD. This one expresses the 30 members of the ETF based on their MACD uh, histogram seasonal location. Lots of things in the fall. What does that mean? They all had great runs and they're above the zero line, but they're starting, starting to falter 
as it's near an all-time high or at the all-time high. So it's rolling over into the fall. That is a time to be careful, to lock in the gains that you've made, but to be ready for a resumption uh, back into the summer. I want you to notice that those things that were in the fall but have resumed the summer include the important names like U.S. Real Estate, Brazil, DIA, SPY, Technology, and Financials. When you get something that was summer, fall, and back into the summer, that tells you that you could get a second leg up. So those are the relative strength leaders that are already demonstrating people willing to buy them. The ones that are in the fall are the ones that haven't made that turn yet. So like IWM, that's in the fall. And we know that the small caps are lagging the large caps. So that tells you if you see market up and tech better, go for it. But if you see market up but IWM better, that tells you that those reluctant traders are starting to juice the futures contract for the Russell, and they are aggressively pursuing upward gains. So there's room for IWM to play catch-up. That's a pair trade, according to the Anderson regime, and so on. So that gives you some ideas about fall, spring, summer, and winter. Now, just take a look at NIO. That's a, uh, that's a China eBay or something like that, some China tech thing. My officers love that thing back when that was trading up around uh, 9 and $10. They wanted to put money. I said, take a look at the chart. I don't know if I would do that. It sold off to two and a half, and they were glad they didn't do that. And I said, around, uh, you know, around three bucks, that notice how that dragon rolled over and you get an owl entry, that second green dot and the third green dot. Uh, you had a three scoops and covered, we ventured another short, and then that scratched, and that gave it enough time to be deep into the spring and became an owl, which we then just put a second position on. And the target is all the way back up at that purple line at the last place that it got to before it collapsed. So you could see that as a collapsing dragon as the first and the second position and the third position on the short side were all... Uh, continuing to fail and collapsing dragons and then it bottomed out and gave us an owl entry and and all, all. so that I that's the move that I like that's why I love the owl and if that owl had failed the size of that failure on the upside would have been the size of the failure to the downside on a percentage basis but NIO is not going to zero because the Chinese government will buy it and keep it in business because that's what they do so that was like just buying an option. If you bought it at 3 bucks with a $3 trailing stop, you just bought an option on NIO. And then if China's not going to go out of business over the next 100 years, that's going to be a good position. So that's why you might be interested in that strategy. So one of the things I like to do is looking at an expanded set of symbols and just find the things that were in the winter that went into the spring. That's how you find owls. Owls begin to thrive in the spring. So a winter that was an exceptional sell-off and now becoming spring is the owl, and then the continuation patterns become the spring into the summer. So you can use this idea just on its own as a strategy and then go frame those in the way that we're going to learn to frame tomorrow. So just from, uh, there's, there's a dozen ideas just from that chart alone. So you don't even have to listen to the previous hour-long discussion of trivia. You might discover you just want to do four seasons of MACD and use that as a guide. That's not dumb. ADX still working. Details. Um, I'm looking at the market mosaic. This helps me appreciate market classification. So this upper left-hand corner, the 30-day regression line, the slope of that is so good that we were... Uh, well more than one day's, uh, one standard deviation compared to the last 180 days. Chart two is the uh, slope uh, expressed over 180 days. You can see the time series. That is the slope stat of the market. One of the reasons that I was concerned about this movement in the S&P was notice how that has now closed to that black line. That black line is the 10-day moving average of the slope. And whenever that crosses over its own 10-period moving average and it's already more than one standard deviation above the black line, 
that solid black line is the average, that has often been a turning point on an intermediate basis. And so what I was looking at Friday was a market that was well overextended, had an amazing 30-day performance. I mean, uh, one of the best five in the last 10 years and, that, and is now starting to roll over in a slope stat. Wouldn't surprise me if that was an intermediate high. So let me take off half my positions, the ones that were already starting to suffer, raise some capital. Now, if I need to quickly hedge, I can get to market neutral. Oh, I'm already market neutral. So whatever the market's going to do, I'm either going to take off the long positions because it's failing, and I'm going to add two scoops on the short side, or if it goes off, I'll take off the hedge, and I'll just be directional. So I have no gap risk overnight, and I funded that with the money that I harvested from Friday. And I used that with a leverage position so I didn't tie up a lot of capital to achieve market neutrality over the weekend. So I can go through this suffering with you and not worry about what's going to happen on Monday. Because I knew that we're going to be practicing and working and my attention on Monday is on your learning and not on managing my positions. So I want to be market neutral in the world going into Monday. So that's why when we go through the other uh, slides of the 60 slides we're going to look at. Ugh. That's why I needed to be market neutral for that. Okay. Um, the stretch stat is simply taking a look at how far has price moved away from the 200 moving average compared to its history and the standard deviation. So you can see that 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 uh, that eight and a half percent we are above the 200 that's the best it's been in the last 180 days that's how good this market has been and that's a reason why it could keep going but just know that historically that's been that's already been pretty good chart five is a 10-year look at the slope of the 30 compared to the last 10 days notice that on the 10 day or the 10-year basis this is one of the five best, one, two, three, six best. This is one of the six best 30-day performances of the last 10 years. It's a two sigma performance looking at the long-term look back period. That's how good this is. Notice what happened on all previous five excursions to this level. It was... Uh, something else, not so much. It doesn't mean it was a rapid sell-off. It just means that the outperformance began to stall and came back to historical norms. So I didn't feel particularly worried about harvesting some of that money because historically, the easy money, which is never easy, has already been made. So now I'm ready for the next phase of operations. Continuation? Oh, I'll just get back in. Ah, Sideways, well, I know how to play sideways quiet channel and breakouts. Oh, sell off, well, I know how to hedge and take the short side intraday. So I know how to do all those things. I'm ready for all of those contingencies, starting with a look at the S&P and then finding my logic chain to the outside as I go further and further. But tomorrow, or Monday, which just feels like tomorrow, I got to get the market call right. So it's going to start with what are the futures doing? Are they going to indicate a really big gap? That tells me the market is going to be in play right from the get-go. If it's a quiet opening, chances are it's to the upside, and there's just going to be reward the upside. So I'm already starting to build in a scenario based on what are the futures doing to indicate what the opening of the market's going to be like and use that as my primary guide for the first 30 minutes. Then I'm going to look to see, is it energy, financials, or technology? One of those three sectors is going to be large in either direction and will be the primary driver. Technology, if it goes the upside, that's what it's going to be. Least surprising move of all. If it's energy, that means, oh, the energy sector is starting to receive profits, and now that's going to go. Um, if it's financials, that wouldn't surprise me. Financials work while the rest of the market is suffering. It's, we'll talk more about that. So that's chart five. Um, chart seven, if you, you take that accordion squeeze of the, it's a 10-year look back, and just look at the last 200 days, that, that lets you see the first, the, the last 200 days instead of a 10-year look back, it expands that accordion a little bit, a little bit better. So notice how that thing went from uh, uh, very steep to 
to um, to not so much, and two legs down. Uh, those other two, uh, don't worry about chart six. I'm just toying with that. Chart eight is the S and P's volatility. So I just take ATR divided by price. I'm interested in that. It shows you the historical change that 60 days ago, a normal ATR for the S&P was a one and a half percent move. Right now, it's only 0.8 percent. So in the last 60 days, the market, the S&P's volatility is half of what it was just 60 days ago. At the peak of the market terror in 2008-2009, that number was almost 4%. And if it had been 2%, it would have been abnormally quiet. And that 2% is, all, is twice, all, three times as large as what it is now. So the seasonality of volatility, in other words, the volatility of volatility, has a seasonal component to it. So if you're going to be informed by volatility, appreciating that time series of the dimensions of what is normal and what is abnormal changes through time. Just in the last 100 days, it's had a very signif two significant regime changes. It went from the 1% down to 0.6, then up to 1.6, and now back to 0.7. That's how significant that has been. Now, what that tells me is VXX, which has been smashed, is the first sign that volatility is going to be coming back in. So I'm going to be paying attention to, to VXX. If the market is suffering, I'm long VXX automatically. I'm going to put that order in so if it moves some measured distance above the current price, it's going to auto enter me into that. It's going to have to be a significant volatility spike, so I'm just going to go ahead and put that in, and I'll get surprised into that position, and I'll look to frame that one on the upside. The last one we're going to talk about, this is the one I probably spend more time on, and you are, I have made it almost impossible for you to, to enjoy listening to this discussion because you're probably tired right now because I'm tired of hearing myself talk, but here it is. So the Z scores of three different regression lines. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at the slope statistic of the RL10, the 30, and the 90. I've already been discussing the 30. You see that black line and how it rolled over at almost two sigma? The slope of the, the 10 got up to three sigma and is now already starting to roll over. So that means that this outperformance of the S&P has started to already decay these last two days. Oh, it was quiet. It didn't fail, but the momentum wasn't there for those last two days. Now, they didn't try to sell it, but it's already fragile. That's what that 10 rolling over means. And that was enough to make the 30 roll over at two sigma. Now, the red line is the 90. That's the longer term. That's like the weekly 30. That's the, if I was looking at this on weekly charts, that would be the slope, the 30 period slope stat of that. And then below that, you notice that's the red and the green is the river, and that's price. So price is like an alligator or dragon has crawled from below the river, across the river, and out has had one, two, three legs up already. Oh, hard to sustain that. But he is at an all time high. That move of the last 120 days has been so good that the red line went all the way up to three sigma, then sold off in two legs down. That gave us the spike. And then that recovery move, which has made that last 30 days so brilliant, was so good that it already turned the 90 and is already starting for its next leg up. So that tells me that the long-term buy and holders are ready to add positions because the U.S. has been, where else are you going to go? Gold? No, it's already a three sigma gain, and it's not large enough to handle size. Treasuries? Yeah. It already sold off harshly, and it's ready to go. Treasuries is a good buy for those guys. Or they could just roll that money back into the U.S. You're not going to go anywhere else. If the S&P starts to suffer, none of the other sectors have been so good that it makes you want to buy Europe 
or by China, except in a speculative way. The only place that's already working, Brazil. It's already near the top of the stack. I'm watching Brazil carefully. But that's money that's ready to go back into the S&P. So they'll say, hey, already at an all-time high, Trump has weathered all the storms. The Democrats are morons. They're all going to lose. They're so stupid. They can't figure out how to run a campaign. So it's going to be Trump, and he's uh, been good for the stock market despite all his other shortcomings. So that's, their, that's, their, uh, that's the sheep talking right there. So there's, there's room to the upside is what the 90 is saying. That has stabilized the potential for another leg up. That means another 5 to 8% is already in, baked into the cake. That is a $15 move in the S&P. 315 is in play on the upside for those of you keeping score at home. I swear to God, that, that's the last thing I want to say. Everything else in that daily report are details and things for of research interest, but that's plenty of ideas. Now, all of those dynamics that we just talked about are going to be in play all week. So now I have seeded my longer-term brain with all of those relationships. I'm going to draw a logic chain diagram that tells me how am I going to get from the S&P to those sectors to those companies. I'm going to go back through my notes, which if I had been making them, would list all the symbols that I'm going to go and prepare a trade frame on. So that was just planning to find 20 ideas for market up, market down, market noisy, market quiet, sectors up or down, market to the sector to the leading and lagging candidates with ways to start turning that into prepared trade frames. It probably took me an hour and a half to go through this. I beg your pardon. Uh, it usually takes me 15 minutes to call off those ideas. I don't explain them in the weekend report. If guys don't come to this and listen to that and they have questions, I say, well, maybe you ought to just study the home study courses. Um, but I go through this with you because... This is the market is at a critical state right now. It is compressed into a doji at an all time high with plenty of reasons why it could go higher or lower, either slowly or quickly, and lots of candidates that we could get even more leverage on. But if we get the market right this week, we're going to be great. A critical state is defined as a moment when. There's a higher than normal probability that the market is going to make a larger than normal move in a shorter than normal period of time. It's a coiled spring ready to go in either direction and we can use our work norms to figure out what the difference of an average or a normal or an abnormal move is and how far it could go. Some of those like the back to the RL270, some of those were nine ATRs. Could be to the 10-day high. Some of those were five reward-to-risk ratios based on daily ranges. Intraday, we can use frog boxes and regression lines and support and resistance to calibrate those expected moves. And we can trade those in a professional way. So plenty of ideas to think about. My bowl feels full. So I'm going to stop that one and... and um, we will um, record that and save that video. That's a mini master class on how to read the weekend and daily reports and what those things mean. Now, everything I said, I hoped I had put into words for those who know what those words mean. But this is a chance to be more verbose about it, and I want to plant that seed with you today. What I will probably do later tonight is re-record that, but in the usual cadence. So just the 15-minute piece, and that gives you still 48 hours to really figure out where those ideas were coming from. And you'll be able to think about this tonight as you look at the report and some of the things that appealed to you. Kind of concentrate on those, and I'll ask you to come in tomorrow with some aha moments because of the work you did tonight and maybe some questions about things that you know. If you spend more than five minutes trying to figure out what I meant by what I said, that's enough to make that a good question, bring that 
good question tomorrow and one of your three peers may be able to answer it. And if three of you can't answer your question, then that becomes a question that's interesting to me because then everybody will have that question because I wasn't clear or I wore you out. If I've done my job, you should be uh, full right now. All those, those last two pages that I'm not even going to read on the ETF2, it's just more of the same. Only that gives you the top 100, and it's not only the upside, but it's also the downside candidates. And once you understand what I just said previously, you can look at that one as a swing trader or position trader and come up with 20 tradable ideas from either the bottom, where you're going to go short, or the bottom starting to improve like a catfish, or an owl, or rewarding long and strong, or finding the emerging leaders. There are four different strategies that are easy to sort out um, that you can see in the, in the weekend report. So that's what I want to say about the weekend report. And that's where I'm going to stop the, uh, the video. Thanks for those of you playing. So that was an hour and 15 minutes. That was five times as much time as I normally spend on it when I'm narrating it. It normally takes me 15 minutes to announce those big ideas, but without explanation. When I read the report, after I print them and look at them, I, I can get all that in three minutes in my own little head because I've conditioned myself through battle drill and expertise of what I'm specifically looking for. And then I can trade frame those quickly. Um, but I I spend the time on this with you because the long-term robust edge is being adaptive and having ideas before you need them. Knowing where these different ideas are and learning how to connect strategies and turn them into systems and improve your technique so that you can have some tips about what to do. That's the long-term commitment to learning uh, in an ecosystem of learning that goes far beyond what I'm doing. I don't want you to trade exactly like me. I would like you to think about the markets in those ways so we can get better together. Mercy.